Okay, um, I'm Frederick. Um, Vishesh and Elkanan unfortunately couldn't make it today, so I'll give both talks. So we were, uh, this talk is about mean field approximation. So first, I should explain what's the Ising model because we're going to approximate them. So an Ising model, you know, here's a nice picture. Oh, oh, this is the wrong one. <laughs> okay, no, no, no laser pointer. So anyway, it's just um, a very simple probability distribution uh, on the discrete hypercube. And it's probably one of the simplest things you can think of, which uh, actually has correlation structure. Because all we do is we write the probability as e to a quadratic um, polynomial in the spins. And the way to interpret this is, OK, the h's are just some bias terms. We call that external field. And the j's, those are more important. Those are the interactions. So if j i j is positive, it means i and j want to be the same. If it's negative, it means they want to be different. Um, but you, know, you can see in this example, for example, there could be negative and positive interactions. So what actually happens could become complicated. Um, and of course, there's no reason you need to stop at quadratic polynomials, right? So you can put any, say, degree k polynomial into that exponent. And that would be known as a k Markov random field. Uh, so we have results for all k Markov random fields, but I'll only talk about Ising models with so h is 0 just to simplify things. So what do we want to compute in this Ising model? Well, we want to compute the log partition function, which I'll call the free energy. So this is probably the most important thing to compute. So there's, <coughs> sorry. So I just put a few reasons here, but there's many more. So if you were to graph the free energy as a function of so-called inverse temperature, which is rescaling the edge weights, then you would find the locations of phase transitions, which is, of course, the classical thing to do in statistical physics. Um, also, if you can compute f well enough, you can sample, and even if you can't compute it quite that well, you can estimate many quantities which are, are of natural interest. And finally, actually, the problem of computing the free energy is a, is a generalization of the classical max CSP problems, which are very popular to study in combinatorial optimization. So this is the free energy, right? It's the log of the partition function, which is just this big sum over all possible spin states. But the amazing thing is that there's actually a totally different formula, which is exact. Um, we call it the Gibbs, Gibbs variational formula. And the Gibbs variational formula just, it, uh, it's actually an optimization over the space of all probability distributions. And uh, what you do is you maximize this sort of energy term, which is the contribution of the quadratic functional, so this, the sum of these gijs, uh, x, xijxj. But then there is a trade off, because if you just optimize that, it would be combinatorial optimization. Um, but you also have this entropy term, so that's gives this interesting trade-off, and that's what makes this a very interesting thing to compute. And the proof is actually very simple, so I won't go over that. But. So what's the mean field approximation? So that's why I need to explain this. So a priori, the Gibbs variational principle is optimization over all probability distributions. But we could try to simplify this by restricting to a simple class. So mean field, I restrict to product distributions. And so uh, immediately from the Gibbs variational principle, I see that this will always give me a valid lower bound. And moreover, actually, you can interpret the gap between the true free energy and our approximation, and it's exactly the KL divergence um, from the true Ising model to the closest product distribution. And to interpret the solution, you should observe that if you just differentiate this equation, um, the uh, critical points are just solutions of this thing called mean field equation. So I'll illustrate this very quickly with an example. So this is called a Curie-Weiss model. So I have all the edges are connected, and they have positive edge weights. So they all want to be the same. And I can write down the mean field equation. And it says that uh, basically my, the belief or the, this, this number at vertex i, it's just this tangent of this weighted average of all of the other guys. So it's very easy to solve this. So you'll see that if the edge weights, I'm scaling them by beta. If beta is below 1, then the optimal solution is all zeros, which is a uniform distribution. And if beta is bigger than 1, I get um, there's actually two optimal solutions that are symmetrical. Um, and basically, when beta is big, these are close to all ones or all negative ones. So the thing to understand here is mean field, it matches a product distribution to the model, but it doesn't moment match. It tries to produce something which looks like a typical sample from the model. So yeah, obviously, uh, that's much different from moment matching. So this has been a big topic of interest recently, is how well does this mean field approximation work? So this is actually very classical. And for Curie Wise, it's known for a long time that this is a very accurate. But, um, in general, I think the things really started with this big graph limits paper by Borgs, Chase, Lovas, Shosh, and Vestergombi. 
and they show this bound. Um, okay. Okay. Do I not use a laser pointer? Right, I'm not going to worry about this. Top? Okay, whatever. Um, oops, I spoiled it. Okay, so anyway, they showed this bound. Um, the thing about this bound is that it requires j infinity to basically scale like 1 over n. And the way to think about this is usually you need to scale your model as n goes to infinity by 1 over the degree. Um, so this actually just is a very strong density assumption. It's basically saying your model has average degree close to n. Um, so that was the state of the art for a while. And then there was a huge improvement by Basak and Mukherjee, who built on work of Chatterjee and Dembo. Um, and then this is further tightened by Eldan, and it produced this bound. And I won't go into the details, but you know, this bound is like way better than the other bound, and sort of applies to much sparser models uh, with basically average degree that's um, super constant. And, uh, but the thing about this is that both Basak and Mukherjee and Eldon use very sophisticated technology, um, which, okay, uh, it's, not, it's not super intuitive why these things are related to mean field. And, uh, but the good thing about this bound is it's actually tight in some examples. So um, now I'll just tell you what is our bound. It's a new bound. So the, the big thing I'm proud of for this proof is that it's very simple. So, um, but there's other good things about it. So, if you rewrite it this way, um, as the NGF to the two-thirds, then the exponent two-thirds is actually optimal. So this, this bound is maybe you know, tighter than all the previous bounds. And in fact, you can show that uh, it dominates all previous bounds up to the, there's a log term, which is actually unnecessary. So if you ignore that log term, it's actually always a better bound. And oftentimes, it shows much, uh, much faster convergence rates. So let me just say, there's also algorithms <laughs> in this paper. So mean field, you know, how useful is it if we can't compute it? So in the Debruchian uniqueness regime, which is a high temperature regime for the model, we can show that just iterating the mean field equations is a very good algorithm. So it converges exponentially fast to the global optimum of the mean field problem. Um, and then in the case that the models are ferromagnetic, there's a more complicated algorithm which involves some classical Mark Markov chain results, which I won't go into details. But in that, in that case, the problem is genuinely non-convex, but there is a way to solve it. And uh, in general case, you can't solve it. I mean, it's just, uh, that's not so hard to show. But actually, um, if you look at our proof of the mean field bound, it's basically an algorithm. So you can actually extract an algorithm which gets this approximation. Um, and I'll just say that there is an algorithm by Risteski in a previous cult, which worked in the same situation, but is a little bit worse. So it requires, um, basically, there are some examples where this requires polynomial time, but R actually just requires constant time. Um, yeah, so we have improved uh, Rysteski's result. Um, how much time do I have? OK, so yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about the proof sketch. So the really important uh, tool we use is this thing called a regularity lemma. So actually, regularity lemma was previously used in works on this, but we use it in a much more efficient way. Um, so what is a regularity lemma? It's, always something that decomposes some arbitrary object into a structured part and a pseudo-random part. So to visualize the structured part, I have this little picture. So basically, um, it's a sum of these things called cut matrices, and they sort of represent uh, dense bipartite weighted graphs. And the idea is basically, if you think of the Ising model as a graph, it looks like the combination of all of these bipartite graphs um, with some pseudo-random noise, which is just not drawn in the picture. Um, and the other fact that we use in a very crucial way is just this sub-additivity of entropy, which is really, you know, the thing that's special about product distributions. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think I'm not going to explain this in detail, but basically weak regularity, okay, gives you a way to decompose the quadratic form into a very simple part and a part that's a pseudo-random part you can actually ignore. Um, and the thing that's important is actually there's only, uh, if maybe if I go back to this picture, I'm actually just going to count all the, for every state, there's only so many possibilities for the number of elements that are spin plus in each RI or CI. So I'll just cluster the spins by all this information. So there's not too many, so many clusters. And then I'll just extract the best cluster. And finally, there's a trick where I use max entropy to guarantee that I can find an even better product distribution. So I'll get some nice results once I optimize epsilon. And that, that's basically the proof. So just a uh, quick summary is we have a much simpler bound for mean field approximation now. 
Um, we have new algorithms for estimating log z. They don't require any kind of correlation decay, which is usually the case for markup chains. And you can't get really a better algorithm unless p goes mp. And there are some good open problems, but I won't explain them now. Yeah. If I, if I understand correctly, Frederick is not going anywhere for the next 10 minutes. So why don't we hold the questions off until his second talk is over? All right. Yeah, sorry, how do you use the laser pointer? 